Thank you, Deborah Voigt, for joining, for joining us here at the Artist Studio presented by the Abu Dhabi Festival. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so how would you describe Oprah to someone who is encountering it for the first time? I would tell them not to be afraid of opera. <laughs> you know, I think people have very preconceived ideas about opera. They think that they're going to have to study for several hours in order to understand. They think they have to dress a certain way. And uh, I think they think that we as opera singers are very uh, pretentious and elitist. And we're not. We're <laughs> most, some are, of course. But in general, everyone is, is like everybody else. And, and oftentimes, when you go to the opera now, pretty much all over the world, you have the translation of the opera in whatever language you speak, either above the stage or at the Metropolitan Opera, it's in the seat in front of you. So there's no reason to be afraid that you won't understand. And uh, I think it's important to choose the first opera that you see very carefully. It wouldn't be good to go and say, see, uh, Gouda Demerung by Wagner, because it's five hours long and it's very, very serious, heavy German music. And that's not for everybody. So it would be better to go see something like Carmen or La Boheme, something that is a little bit more accessible to people that are not familiar with opera. Opera, makes sense. You're considered the most influential dramatic soprano of the 20th century. Which roles and experiences have shaped this impressive status? Well, first of all, thank you for that compliment, although I'm not sure it's really true. Um, but I have been very lucky in that I sing a repertoire that not a, a lot of ladies can do. I have a very big voice, and so I've sung a lot of roles by the composer Verdi and Strauss and Wagner. And uh, that is a, a small group of, of women that can do that, or men for that matter. So I think that's contributed a lot uh, to the success that I've had. I've also had a very long career and for many opera singers, if you, if you have a career that lasts for 10 years, that's considered a good career. And I've been singing for 30 years, something like that, yeah. and at a very public level. Um, so I've been very fortunate, but it's a big responsibility. Definitely. You know, any sort of talent that you have, that any of us have, uh, you feel a responsibility to do the most that you can with it, even if you are exhausted at the end of those 30 years. Yeah, well, I think you, you should always develop it, your skills as much as you can. Yeah. And it's it takes a long time, uh, especially for, well, for anyone. But I find myself now uh, working as a professor of voice at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. So I'm working with very young people. Some are freshmen who are 18, 19, and they don't understand how long it takes to build an opera career. I think especially, I mean, maybe this is true of your culture as well, but in, in the United States, we have these shows called American Idol mm -hmm. or The Voice. Yeah. And so someone will come on and become known across the country by millions of people like that. And I think that opera, young opera singers kind of expect that same sort of opportunity, and it just doesn't work that way. What it takes to develop an operatic voice is not something that happens overnight. Considering their length and technical requirements, not only in terms of vocals, but also their need for expressive and expe exceptional acting, leading dramatic opera roles must be very physically and emotionally demanding. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That is very true. <laughs> uh, what has been your most challenging role and why? Oh, I think that it always ends up being the one that I'm doing at the time. Yeah. And they all have different aspects of them that are, that are more complicated than others. Um, some of them are what we used to call park and bark, which means that you just walk out on stage and you stand in one place and you sing. But that's way, way ago in the past, and now uh, singers are expected to be able to act. And it's, it's very difficult because, as I was talking about these young people, just learning how to make a good sound is difficult enough in a foreign language. 
then to learn the staging, learn how to interact with someone takes an enormous amount of time. But the most difficult for me, I, I did uh, the role of Zalome, which is the character from the Bible who asks for the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. And she has to do the dance of the seven veils, which is basically wearing seven veils and losing one here and losing one there. And that was very difficult. I was several years younger and thinner, but I was in the gym for hours and hours getting ready for that. And then the Wagner Ring Cycle is three huge operas that are very, very long and a lot of words and a lot of memory work. And that's always been the thing that's the most difficult for me is, is memory work. He wanted to tell me he was leaving me. He waited too long to tell me that I was self-righteous. Even when I was wrong and I spoke about friendship till our friends gave me opposite for the moment for its reason. He wanted to tell me the truth. Can you tell us about how you first came to Oprah? And what inspired you to preserve in such a challenging art form? I, I kind of just fell into it. I had been taking piano lessons and then found myself singing in church a lot. And I realized at a very young age that when I sang, I got a response from the audience. They enjoyed it. They got the message, whatever, whatever it was. I'm not sure how to describe it. So I thought when I got to high school, well, I'm just going to take some, some voice lessons. And it, it happened that the wife of my high school choral conductor was a voice teacher, and she was an opera singer. So she had me start to study a classical vocal training. And then I, I really just took one opportunity after another. There were competitions that I would do, and I would win it. And, and my voice was naturally operatic in quality and large, and so it, it just kind of went that way. But I think sometimes when I say that, I don't give myself enough credit, because yes, I fell into it, but I also worked really, really hard. Yes. Really, really, really hard. You're also a celebrated recitalist with a particularly broad repertoire of art songs and American greats. What do you enjoy about these kind of concerts? I like, having an opportunity for an audience to get to know me. When you're playing these very larger than life characters on a big stage where you have to sing over a huge orchestra, there's so much distance between me, Debbie, and the Deborah Voigt that the audience sees. So at this point in my career, I'm at a very lucky place where I can choose what I want to sing and have a little bit of fun with it. And so, of course, I do classical pieces in my recital because I'm an opera singer, so that's what people want to hear. But I also want to play with my own language. I don't get to sing in English as an opera singer. And to show uh, a more humorous, flirtatious side to my personality that people don't expect. And that's, that's rewarding at this point in my life. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Um, you dedicated a lot of your time to being a teacher, mentor, and academic, working with the next generation of talent. Why is this important to you? What do you gain from this experience? Well, I had a very important mentor in my life. When I began my college studies, I worked with a woman named Jane Paul. And she was probably maybe a few years younger than I am right now when she was my teacher. And she taught me a lot about singing, of course, but she also taught me a lot of life lessons, you know, how to get along with my colleagues, how to be a good musician, how to be prepared, how to have a conversation about something that maybe you don't feel you're doing well and you need help from someone there's a way to ask for help that will get what you want rather than being argumentative in some way. And she remained my friend for many, many years and still is. And in fact, uh, later this month, she's turning 90. And so she's been with me through my whole life, you know, from the time that I was very young and in her studio crying because I was so frustrated. And now I have young girls in my studio who are crying because they're so frustrated to watching my career develop, attending many, many of those performances, and now coming 
basically full circle to where she was when I met her. So it's a, it's a very special relationship and it meant a lot to me. And it's the sort of thing that I think is important between a voice student and their teacher in particular. Because singing, your instrument is your body and it's connected to your emotions. It's not like playing an external instrument where you know if you're upset the flute isn't going to play as well. If you're singing and you're upset it does affect your voice. Yep. Or if you're angry. I always sang really well when I was angry. <laughs> There's something about that maybe just uh, you get very ferocious <laughs> for some reason. But um, yeah being able to work with these young singers not only on their voices but on their head and what goes on in those little heads that uh, can, can stay with them for many years. You know, we tell ourselves about things about ourselves all the time and those can be really great things and it goes over and over in your head that way or they can be very negative and I try to help them with that. It's not easy but I try. Um, even though I'm going out of the script, I have so much respect for talented artists who really dedicate some time, even if it's a little time, to younger uh, performers or artists because it really does affect the artists in general to develop. I, I, I really have so much respect for people who teach and spend time developing the next generation. Yeah. Well, the thing that's really wonderful about it and uh, is that because I've, I've sung at the level I have and with the conductors I have, there's nothing that these young singers are going to ask me that I haven't already been through. <laughs> I will have an answer for them. <laughs> As a tradition, opera is historically very rooted and celebrated in Europe and America. It's becoming increasingly popular in other parts of the world. In the Arab world, there are new operas being produced and new singing talents emerging. What do you think are the necessary steps and requirements for the scene to further develop here? Well, I mean, it would be hard for me to say because I haven't had hands-on experience or been able to observe uh, the opera productions that are taking place here. That being said, we are halfway around the world from, from where many of these operas began and where many of the conservatories and, and programs exist to train young singers. And I think that maybe it would be beneficial to have some successful opera singers come in and do residencies or conductors come in and spend maybe two weeks or something like that just to open up the eyes of the younger people that haven't had the opportunity to go to the Metropolitan Opera or to go to Vienna or, or someplace else like that. So rather than expecting that group of people to be able to go out, it might be helpful to bring them in, bring people in to work with the young people. What advice would you give to someone starting out in operatic singing today? Oh my, well, it's, that's, that's difficult because it depends on what they want. You know, what, what kind of a life do you want? A lot of young singers have a great voice or a nice voice and feel the responsibility that we spoke about earlier to do as much with it as they can. But I don't think they often stop and think about what does that mean to your life? If you are blessed enough to have the sort of career that, that I've had, which is very unusual, you're gonna be gone 10 to 11 months of the year traveling around the world. Do you want that for yourself? Do you want to have a family? If you do, that's something you have to think about, you know? because there's, there are sacrifices that have to be made. I also try to make sure that there isn't something else that they're really interested in, that they're passionate about. Now, I'm not going to say that in their first voice lesson. You know, wow, that was great. What else would you like to do? It's probably not the way to go. But to be as honest with themselves about their abilities as is possible while not discouraging them. It's a very, it's a bit of a tightrope walk, uh, we would say. 
But yeah, to be honest about it. And it's difficult. We just finished an auditions uh, season at the school that I'm employed at. And you know, it's a business like anything else. And so we have to have a certain amount of students. And that's always a very difficult choice. You know, you hear someone and you think, I don't know that that person will really have a great career. But maybe they will find out during the course of their study that they're really interested in musicology or administration. And so just because they enter as a, an opera singer, uh, it potentially, they can be led in different directions. And the conservatory in San Francisco is very good about making sure that students are educated in things like how to take care of their taxes, how to form uh, corporations if they decide they want to have a string quartet. Uh, so it gives them practical sort of experience too and not just filling their heads with, you're going to be the next Deborah Voigt. Finally, a question that we ask all our artists to do participants. What is creativity to you? Well, it's interesting because I uh, was involved in writing a one-woman show called Voigt Lessons. And I applied, it was written by a famous American uh, writer named Terence McNally. And I applied to go to a camp where you are housed and you can work on whatever works you want to work on. And the opening night celebration, the woman who chose who was to participate in this program said that I almost didn't get in because I am not a creative artist. I am an interpretive artist. And that really bothered me <laughs> because I thought every time I go out on that stage, I'm as creative as I can be. Uh, no performance is the same. It's, uh, I'm constantly having to create what my life is now as an artist, as a person, and it never ends. From the time you begin until the time that you end, you're always having to create new experiences and new relationships. And so I think that um, I'm interpretive because I interpret the music of, of composers who have been out and gone from this world for many, many years. But I also, as I you will be singing in the program tomorrow night, am singing uh, pieces that were created for me. So I think that I think that's the best description I could give you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. For such an amazing. You're interview. welcome. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.